um, obviously people can keep joining as and when uh, we sort of kick off, but uh, we'll get the show started. Um, so yeah, thanks for everybody sort of in attendance. Um, this is our fourth security room now and it is the last one of 2020 and like i've sort of been saying in all the videos you know i'm dead chuffed to sort of be able to say that you know we've got jj davy and greg van der Gast speaking for us tonight um and we will be going through uh right under the bonnet of um basically one of the hot, hottest topics inside security at this moment in time um and that is devsecops um and who better two guys to sort of uh, lead us through it than, than these two um sort of around sort of 20 to 7 we will also be sort of um, changing topics as well. And um, it's actually a chance to sort of, you know, me and Steve Arnold, um, who's my colleague from Birmingham, will also be answering some questions from Greg and Jay around the sort of recruitment processes and cybersecurity at this moment in time. Um, so if you've obviously got any questions for that as well, uh, please use the Q&A function throughout. Um, and we will be having a Q&A uh, also for Greg and Jay around DevSecOps at seven o'clock. But um, yes, so moving on, um, if my presentation will let me. So essentially, um, me and my colleague Steve Arnold are presenting tonight um, and just a little bit about myself is I've been the security specialist for re-technology now for just over 18 months. Um, essentially, I cover the Northwest region and just speak to basically cyber professionals all day, every day, um, basically as north as the Lake District, as so south as Sheffield, but mainly around the Manchester region. Um, and then I'll also let my colleague Steve come in now. Yeah, cheers, Nick. Um, yeah, pretty much covered that there. I, uh, except I'm, I'm in the Birmingham office. I, so I'm the principal cybersecurity consultant um, down here. I cover basically all of the Midlands, so pretty much as far north as Stoke-on-Trent, probably as far south as sort of Northampton, and then we kind of go east to Peterborough and left over to sort of Telford, uh, the border of Shropshire, really. Um, but yeah, again, I mean, I've been here sort of two and a half years. Um, we came up with the idea of you know starting these things to. To, to build a community of like-minded people so we can sort of share some knowledge and um, yeah, and get to know some, uh, well, again, like-minded people. But yeah, that's pretty much the long and short of it really uh, from myself. In terms of who we are, um, so a lot of people will be, will be familiar with uh, Reed as a recruitment agency. Um, so Reed Technology are a, uh, a sister company, I guess it was started with the idea that you know a lot of people will associate read um i guess with high street recruitment um but we're, we're a dedicated agency like many of the others that you know you'd be familiar with and i think a lot of people don't realize that that we're, we're a totally separate entity um and i guess this is also there to sort of um make some awareness around that in terms of sort of specialists kind of cover the fact that nick and i um cover cyber security as do some of our other colleagues um further north as you know as far as scotland and and, and down in london um but we also cover everything else as well as, as an organization uh, everything from um, dev consultants to data bi mi um uh, project programs a little bit of everything um obviously this particular webinar is around security but you know as an organization we do, we do cover all facets if you like of, of technology um yeah, and essentially me and Steve basically make no secret that we wouldn't have jobs um, sort of without you guys. Um, so, yeah, essentially, you know, I get out of bed in the morning just so I can basically help people sort of um, as many of you in attendance tonight, as well as other people who aren't, you know, basically get a happy resolution, um, whether it's a client trying to, you know, get a cyber professional on board in their team or whether you're a cyber professional trying to do vice versa. We make no secret that we wouldn't have jobs without you guys. So this is our way of giving back. Um, and it's very much led by you guys guys it's very much led by the community i'm i'm, I'm hoping i like uh, i've had people basically message me on linkedin saying oh i'd love the the chance to basically speak at one of the events um and you know I, i'm all for you you guys you know it, it was jay and greg who who proposed the topic of devsecops tonight and we've had previous ones with like the, the likes of daniel pass daniel Oates, lee ian murphy um, and it will be a monthly occurrence so if you are interested in sort of getting involved in future events please do drop me a line um and on that note i will pass over now to um the reason you're here jay and greg so i want me a second so well, there he is mr van der Gast to kick us off uh is, is jay here with us jay's here yeah 
Yeah, I'm there. Well, I, I just want to say we're all supposed to wear uh, Christmas sweaters. We all failed, and thank God we did because Jay would have absolutely slayed us. Slayed us. See what I did there? Um, I'm, I'm actually going to ask Jay to kick off. What are we going to talk about specifically? What are your DevOps gripes or DevSecOps gripes? It's hard to find good. It's hard to find developers right now. In IT skills, it's like the most kind of hardest to find resource, and it's it's yeah. hard still to find security savvy ones. Yeah, hundred percent. I think well, I think the the biggest misconception is what actually is DevSecOps. Um, a lot of people go, oh, it's you know you need to be able to code securely, and that's just you know, really one piece of the puzzle, one ingredient of the cake. But you know we need to understand what what is DevOps first before we before we start to go into the the pain points. So DevOps itself is the combination of development and operations. So you have the developers, the people that code the application, and then you have the the infrastructure guys that actually support the environment that the application sits upon. Um, and then DevSecOps is this whole idea or this kind of cultural change that security interjects into the different points of the DevOps lifecycle. So to put it quite plainly, um, it's just basically having more of a security culture around the whole DevOps lifecycle. Um, there's lots of pain points. And, and as Greg mentioned, one of the biggest pain points is resource. So a lot of companies are trying to find developers really, really quickly. And the reason why they're trying to find so many developers is because they are not using their resources wisely. They're, lots of their developers are getting uh, sucked into different um, you know, different silos which they shouldn't really be involved or it could be relieved, alleviated with a bit of automation in the right area, um, which is something that we're going to go into. But it's also a, it's, it's a big play on security strategy. Um, so if you have these too many silos going on, um, you lose a lot of resources um, across the entire board in, in terms of um, your developers, um, your operations. So a, a lot of it is resource intensive. All right, great. Well, I'm glad you had something to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I particularly like when, when the feed f freezes up and then you catch up and move very, very quickly. Yeah, I wish I could move that fast in real life. These, these are all the serious <laughs> things I have to say this evening. Like, what do you, what do you think like the main, because I, my experience is typically you walk into an organization um, and they don't really have DevSecOps. If anything, sometimes the kind of development side of things is not terribly mature just in terms of development. But even when they are, um, the security is kind of, of lacking. Yeah. You know, it's hard. Go on. Yeah. Uh, so it's in motion, so I'll let you go. Yeah, no, so it's exactly that. It's security is the icing on top of the cake and not the ingredients in the cake you know it's a it's a very um shift right mentality security right at the end of the, of the pipeline um it's the afterthought but devsecops is about this whole idea of shifting the entire thing left let's get security baked into the cake as early as possible you know let's understand the customer requirements okay where, where does security fit into the customer requirements when we build this application if this application is going to be you know using payment card details all, all of a sudden you've got an industry standard, you've got PCI DSS that you need to comply with. So you have some sort of security standard there already that you need to comply with. So that should start to align your development operations moving forward. Uh, if you get it in there early, then you get the vulnerabilities and the risk mitigated early. So when that product goes to the market, it's in a better shape. Right, I, agree. I totally agree. I mean, because I typically you, you find there's an organization and they they may be great developers but there's a lack of uh security savvy now when i say great developers they're really good at getting code that does the functionality and the look and the feel that you want uh but they don't necessarily have security you know uh, considerations they're not necessarily validating inputs they're not necessarily uh making sure all the integrations are there they're not necessarily aware of, you know, things like OWASP, like it's not just what does your application do and should it have secure inputs, but it should also have outputs. It should have, you know, log output so you can troubleshoot stuff if, if it does go awry. So they don't necessarily have those uh, those things. And I think some some it's almost like a quality issue or I, more than almost, it, it is a quality issue. I think if you write more secure code, it tends to be more stable code. Yeah. Uh, um, so right, right there, there's that. And there's some like, like I'll notice like one thing that bugs me about sometimes you'll have an application 
and you go and you you put your cursor in the password f password field, and it the Windows or Mac kind of like automatic password generation, the, the keychain doesn't recognize it as a password field because they coded it, but they didn't make it so you know it doesn't trigger those hooks. And that's just in addition to being a security issue because you just know user is going to come up with a, a weak password because he's not able to use the auto generation stuff. It's it's just annoying. It's just another password I've got to create. It's it's another it's another going to be another weakness. Um, so the challenge is how I mean kind of a CISO level thing is, how do I get those people to start doing that? So I think when it comes to developers, what we need to understand is that developers are developers by skill, by trade. They're not security focused, not security savvy. What they are doing is they are building code to make something work, to make a functionality, to build a product that aligns with the customer idea. Um, that's when security comes in to give uh, these developers the best practice when it comes to coding, whether it be over the shoulder co coding, pair programming, whatever it may be, even on the fly security testing, um, wherever it may be is you need to install that cultural change to the developer for them to be able to develop secure, securely. Um, and that also goes to the build and the test phases, especially in the test phases. If you have proper testing, you know, you have your, your static code analysis, you have a dynamic code analysis and you have it all automated and it's feeding back to the developers. They not only get visibility into the different types of bugs, different times of um, functionality defects that may be present in the code, but they also get that in real time as well. So when they're pushing this, the code to the UAT and it's being tested, they're getting the feedback from the, you know, the analyzing tool and it's highlighting in their code where they're going wrong. And when that keeps happening, much like when we train users for phishing emails, they identify, you know, bad practices in their code and they start to change their behavior. So again, it boils back to that whole cultural change is a big security strategy. Yeah, the, the cultural changes. I mean, the culture is really, really important because that's going to affect also how how they respond to that. You know, it's like it's like it's like constructive criticism versus rubbing their nose in it. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting how you know, if I go into a place and my goal is, OK, I need to create uh, a security framework, a security organization program, whatever, that both fits the organization and is sustainable. Um, I can walk into a company that's completely greenfield. They've gotten to this point without doing any security issues. There's already loads of technical debt, um, but they're just open to, yeah, we don't we don't really know what we're doing. Uh, we'll, we'll happily listen, and when you tell them something, they're like, "Oh!" and they take that on board, and they feel like they're they're um, you know they're educating themselves, and they're improving themselves, and they're gaining skills, and they see that as value add to themselves, and they're very very eager to participate. Um, and then you have Company B, where oh, we've been doing security for five years, we're spending twenty million a year on it, we know what we're doing, blah blah, and you start turning rocks over, and you find actually you've missed a bunch of stuff, and you've got a lot of, a lot of false assumptions, and you're doing the right right thing. I guarantee you, I will get you the company that's technically five years behind where they're clueless to a good place long before company B, just because the culture is kind of resisting and defensive and, and that plays such an important role that I think people don't necessarily appreciate. So I think how you approach your developers with this new concept of security and get them to adopt them is really important, maybe the most important out of anything. Yeah. and developers are naturally quite quick workers so you need to build your kind of pipeline to be able to facilitate that kind of speed that they want to work at so automation here is key so if you're pushing your code to you know your testing environment it needs to be fast and sharp you can't just sit there for days on this report in security it needs to be fed to the developers as quickly as possible and that's where communication is key and that, that goes back down to your culture your security program if you don't have communication across all these different silos that are created like you've got your developers you've got your security you've got your operations if you don't have you know, a solid form of communication between all three uh, functions you're going to fall by the wayside at some way and that's going to have a negative impact on the product that you push to the market so that's when it comes to best practices and communication uh, even something as simple as having like a slack channel or a teams channel between all the teams just to say this is the mission for the week uh, have you got any problems and people need to start raising their voice if you start penalizing people for having problems or doing something wrong that's when they're not going to want to report it and that's when it gets found out in the later stage when it's a zero day in your application and some for actor there is just tickling that zero day yeah i've never really been i think i've never um well never 
I've not focused as much on, on DevSecOps because I've not really worked in organizations that were primarily development based and product based. Um, so I'm, I'm still kind of in my mind thinking of the best ways of doing that. Um, and yeah, I think there's a, there's a number of challenges there and I'm quite mm. curious about uh, what other people do because I don't know, I'm going blank now. So there is a lot of challenges in, in DevSecOps and the, the biggest one is not having a negative impact on a DevOps flight cycle. So if a customer comes to you saying, I want this product in nine weeks, uh, I know everyone's going to be like, oh, you know, a bit of agile, a bit of Kanban, you know, proper project management, but security needs to be involved in that kind of process and we don't want to negatively impact the time to market. So if security go in there and say, oh no, we're going to do it in 12 weeks because we need an extra so many weeks on top, you know, we need to stick within that nine week time frame and still have security in there to the best of our ability and still have a really good output at the end of it. You've just placed all my thoughts. I was like, I drew a blank there. I was like, yeah, for me, it's the, the concerns are, you can't really impact the speed, which is a problem. And I think one of the best ways of doing that is to train the developers themselves. Um, things like a uh, secure code warrior or any kind of like training where it's kind of maybe a bit gamified. Uh, I, I hate the gamified concept. It's done to death, but if it works, it works. Uh, anything that's fun for them where they learn and they, they feel like they're gaining, um, you know, maybe some kind of initiative where you get, you know, 10% of your time is, is dedicated to skills development uh, and then put security as part of that skills development because the, the developers aren't going to complain about having, hey, I got four hours a week where I get to do skills development uh, and that's, you know, that's 10% of their time and you're going to get the secure code from the start as opposed to a six week sprint and then needing another three weeks just to validate the security of it yeah and that's what i say to businesses all the time is that product that's coming out at the end is your brand your reputation can sit on that product so if you're investing in your team and you're investing in their skills and they have the ability to securely design products efficiently and quicker then you're going to get more customer confidence you're going to have a better time to market your product's going to be overall secure by design because they have it instilled in them to be secure I think it's going to be if you learn concepts, you know, like using, um, you know, the, the right input types, the right buffers, the right kind of data types, making sure the integration is tight. The, you know, if you learn more about APIs to can take into security considerations, I think you'll naturally learn other things as well. And that just generally heightens the quality of your code. And it's not just security bugs. You'll just have fewer bugs altogether. You'll have fewer glitches. Uh, things like, you know, you'll, it'll integrate better with security functionality, but maybe other operating system functionalities uh, just be a less annoying, more more maybe standardized with uh, yeah. your customer. Some companies, you'll know, develop applications in a way that's just, why have you done it this way? It's just, it's not wrong, but it's unusual. You know? Yeah. It's not think, in line with how others do it. That no, I think so. that's where we can align to the OWASP secure coding practices. I think that's really where it comes into play. No, so you validate your input, validate it again, uh, you know, proper escape the characters. So if the people are putting in passwords, people like to put special characters in passwords. So make sure it escapes properly, all that kind of stuff. Sanitize your inputs and the outputs, proper programming techniques, you know, least privileges concepts. Uh, and another big one that people seem to miss and, you know, we, we see it often in the community is if you're going to commit to a GitHub, commit cautiously. You know, to, you know, be careful of what you're sharing on that GitHub. And that's where products that come in that like actually you know, hook with GitHub properly and use regex to you know, sanitize your your commits to make sure you're not putting like SSH keys or any credentials yeah. in there. Because, you know, you could have the most secure product, but if you give them the keys to the kingdom, you know, how Mary, you're, you're, you're basically just giving them the, your application. Yeah, Recent, recently dealt uh, with a company that uh, left the credentials in the API that they uh, committed to GitHub. But that's a prime example of why companies need dev, like DevSecOps or the, set, the security kind of mindset is to try and avoid that kind of thing happen, happening. I think there's, there's, you know, sky's the limit in terms of how you want to implement it. I mean, me, ultimately, I think everything comes down to culture. So it's, you know, you can have all the controls and stuff in, in the world. If I ultimately I want to be able to trust the work, the output that people are doing. So, and I know if I have really, really savvy uh, programmer devs i need fewer controls like I'm, I'm willing to trust them with more stuff yeah same way we trust sys administrators with more privileges than regular users um 
and, and that means you know I, I then only have to do some validation and it can be lighter and it can be less time consuming but for me the more proactive you go the the better it is and that kind of change change the culture change the mindset change you know educate um one i think the trickiest part because everyone wants metrics is how, how do you measure it how do you measure improvement it's just like bugs in, in terms of your static and dynamic code analysis bug yeah. count I just say, you know, keep it simple. Uh, what what do you really want for your metrics? Uh, a lot of people go, oh, you know, we need like proper matrix style. We need to really get to nitty gritty. But we could just keep it simple. Like, like fishing tests. How many clicks do you have? Well, how, how many uh, vulnerabilities are in this application when it was first released compared to the old application? And it's just simple comparisons like that. Um, another thing that I like to say as well, and, and this is a big point that I really want to get across, is if you're going to have security metrics outputted from your application, make it in such a way that your security team, your SOC team can analyze that output to understand what's good behavior and what's bad behavior in your application, especially when it comes to stuff like um, brute force attacks or people reusing credentials or trying to uh, manipulate the different parts of your application. If your security team are aware of the outputs from this application, they can actually you know, benefit the security of it and they can actually identify what's abnormal behavior. Uh, and that, that can be fed back into the testing life cycle, back to the continuous de uh, continuous de development life cycle. And then you can you know, feed that into the developers to say, hey, look, we've seen this bad behavior. Can you explain to us what it is? Oh no, that's actually expected. Uh, we've actually got a rate limit or we've got a um, account lockout period. And they say, oh, okay, great. You know, just having that communication is really going to help. Yeah, I think that's that's a pretty good point. I, the more the more you know about how something works, the more you know how to react when you see it working in, in a certain way. And I think this is a real big issue with uh, with socks is that they don't necessarily understand the applications that they're seeing. Uh, not you know, not just in terms of what your devs are doing, but just in terms of business applications, you know, HR systems, uh, payroll systems, all kind of stuff. You, you might see you know, you're just not familiar with the system, so you might be seeing behaviors and you're just you just don't know and you know what, what do you do you're leaving it down to the the sock analyst to do i dismiss this do i action it do i waste someone's time do i look foolish uh, the more communication you have the more you can define that no one looks foolish everybody knows what they're doing yeah uh, I, I, and there's also something that really plays on my mind a lot and uh, as security professionals we get too focused on the security of, of the application we don't actually look at the core fundamentals to security. And I'm not going to go into it because it's boring. It's at the end of it's at the start of every security course. But the availability of your application, so performance monitoring, such as your input outputs, your CPU loads, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, monitoring the containers to make sure that they have proper uptime, proper usage, and that can also have a good benefit to cost. If those containers not being used, spin those containers down. You know, tear them down, and reroute the traffic to a, a container that has low load. It's just all about you know having proper visibility across your estate when you deploy this application um one of the things you want to try and avoid is, is cloud sprawl um so I, i've actually uh, seen a business uh that had you know over 50 containers not being used that's money burning in, in in your pocket if you just you know get rid of all those containers you save money and that money can just be sped back into the actual development life cycle you know training your employees thoughts on the so sometimes you'll have you'll have devops teams that kind of manage their own infrastructure uh, and they can be quite separate from IT ops and they're not necessarily as rigorous in process because they like that you know that agile flexibility hey I need I need 12 s3 buckets for this that 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 and they get provisioned very quickly there's not necessarily change uh, the authentication the RBAC stuff not necessarily done the best way possible any thoughts around that how to actually implement that in a kind of sustainable way so I don't want to start like naming vendors and different solutions and stuff like that, but um, you're going to name people. <laughs> no, so you can actually automate a lot of the deployment, um, and you can have it in such a way that it deploys in a secure way. And when it comes to S3 buckets, one of the biggest problems I have is a lot of people deploy these buckets publicly available, and people can just you know navigate to them and be like, oh, what's in that bucket? Yeah. Oh, it's loads of source code, and that, that's that's a lot of the problem that we see is. Um, I'd say customer pressure or pressure from the senior management can cause these kind of issues. So it's just having the, the mindset that we need to have best security practice when we're doing things, even when we're doing things quickly. Because 
if you, you know your business could rely on one single fault and, and that fault could be massive so leave an s3 bucket open with your product on your ip that's massive for your business especially if it gets leaked yeah i think uh, i think we just about covered it like one one thing i would say not from the DevSecOps or the dev side but more for the security side because I, I always advocate security needs to get more involved like find out how your devs operate mm, yeah. uh, throughout the entire cycle um you know like i recently did something like hey i want to i want to map out how this applicate or rather how this product works you know from the very beginning how the customer interacts with it and they started with like oh well you start here and the data goes here and here and, here, and i'm like no no go go back further Go, go yeah. back to the marketing and the website and the customer sees it, picks up the phone, calls you up. How does that all work? And by chasing that process you know, that far back, like, well, why do you even care about that? Like, well, I just discovered your Salesforce doesn't have MFA, for example. Um, but in terms of how are they actually doing uh, uh, DevOps, because you may find, you know, like you've got people who are putting stuff together on, on Myra boards or uh, other applications where they're drawing out just you know the logical flow of the application and those collaboration platforms sometimes are secure so you, you've got you may have good code you may have secure code but by the way your your entire software architecture is on the internet to anyone that knows the url and so that, i think that's software. why the word DevSecOps kind of grinds on me a bit i think it should just be you know a, bit, a good security culture shouldn't have to worry about security in the DevOps lifecycle, it should be embedded already in the lifecycle. It, you know, you should, you know, you should be set up Dev, Dev, DevOps. Oh, we've got security policies and processes that we need to follow. Um, and I think a lot of it, you know, even if you just look at the application, look at what data is going to be inputted into it, and then you could probably, you know, look at the legal requirements. Especially if you're like you're dealing with, you know, personal data, you probably have a bet that GDPR is going to be involved somewhere. So you want to make sure that you protect people's data. Because uh, again, that's your product, that's your brand, and that's your reputation. And if something was to happen to people's data because of your application, you're to blame. I just can't take you seriously when you're jingling that much. I know. I, I, all I can hear is jingling. <laughs> <laughs> I think the more the more passionate you get, the more it jingles. More jingles. <laughs> awesome. Cool. I think we're half an hour in somehow. Yeah, that the the time has flown there, guys. Um. We've got quite a lot of questions if you don't mind asking yeah uh, let's go I'm sorry um that was brilliant to be fair it is great and uh, yeah i think jay's outfit as well <laughs> it is uh it's it's certainly set the tone um, and i do apologize because I, I was fully supposed to wear a christmas jumper and i totally forgot but anyway i'll just run through these um feel free to take it in turns answering questions or i'll bounce off each other but um so mike p asked um how do you feel about taking developers through security focused um i.e sort of blue red purple team exercises for the first time to get them thinking security is there an ideal cadence I think it's a great idea. Any kind of exposure is good. I mean, how how much you do it, how you do it, and, and the person themselves, you know, how much they're willing to take on that or take in rather, that, that's going to be quite variable, but it, it's not going to hurt. No, I, I think it's, it's very important. Uh, that's why I always say when you go to the testing phase, when your, your application is in the UAT environment, pen that's when you want to start doing your pen testing. That's when you want to start doing your red team engagement. Uh, and this is when um, a good friend of mine, um, Chris, always mentions about fuzzing. You know, fuzzing your application is, is really going to test it. And once your developers, you know, can see your application in the back end, once it's being tested with the fuzzing, um, you can understand where your security defects are, where the defects in the code are. And they can know how to properly respond to that. So you need to make sure that the output from the pen testing and the red teaming and the output from the different security testing is going to be fed back to the developers. Because there's no point just doing these pen tests and going, oh, here's senior management, here's the report. Make sure that this report goes to developers saying, hey, there's a problem here, high severity, what are we going to do about it? Uh, and that just teaches them as well. 
Yeah, I think it's very much about a lot, as you've touched on there, kind of a, a, a holistic view across everything rather than it being separate things that are joined together. It should should all really amalgamate. Um, so Sean has asked, um, we are a WebSec tool provider and hear that piece about resistant developers all the time. Uh, what would be your top tips to overcome this and drive adoption? Um, fast communication, but how can we guide our customers to achieve that? Mm. So you need to have kind of an incentive. Uh, you need to don't punish people. I think when you punish people, that's when the behavior starts to be embedded. You need to start rewarding people, have an incentive, have a positive culture around, you know, good, good practice and, you know, really celebrate people's successes. If you start to build a culture of punish and blame, this is when people start to become tired, angry, fatigued, and they start to make more mistakes and they just embed themselves into this bad behavior. You know, behavioral changes are not overnight. It's, it's quite a long process and it comes with a good cultural change from above. And you need to have security. It's not just security buy in, but also senior management buy in. They need to have the the, you know, the mindset that we need to culturally change our employees to be more positive and more, you know, willing to be more secure. Uh, in terms of coding and developing. So it's a big cultural change and it's it's going to be a long process. If you have a company that's, you know, has a very uh, negative environment already, you're going to go through a hell of a journey with a lot of pain points, um, but it's all about that culture. Yeah, I'm glad you answered that because I was distracted actually reading the questions and I <laughs> wasn't really listening. <laughs> it actually uh, leads but... on really nice, um, Jay, because Matt Ellis actually said that culture is the key and um, essentially said traditionally security and development teams have been at loggerheads with each other. Um, developers wanting to release new features and functionality at a much faster pace to keep up with the market and security only being engaged at the last minute, um, which obviously performing a pen test and shutting the show down until defects are resolved, which can require months of uh, rework. He says that, you know, we need to rebuild trust with those teams and empower them to make the right decisions early on. Yeah. I, mean, I like, um, I think you touched on, um, someone asked a question about legacy and it's, I mean, yeah, it's, it's definitely difficult with, with legacy. And I think there it's, you basically have to, to me, it's all about fixing the various pipelines. Like don't necessarily fix what's there, but fix, fix the process that will produce what's coming up next because everything is being displaced over time. Everything is going in the bin in five years time. So be proactive and fix the process. You know, fix the culture, fix the environment, fix the, fix the process. Um, so yeah, legacy sometimes, you know, that that's a wash, but at least make sure that the good practices are employed when the system that would eventually replace it is built. Um, and I think this kind of ties in with the, the last question that came up where uh, this all sounds fine in theory. However, the reality is that you have the majority of the secu uh, security professionals don't have the bandwidth of babies with developers. Um, and also what happens if they, they don't follow your guidance? How do you address that? Well, the first, it's not just DevSecOps, it's absolutely everything in security. It will never end. And if you don't address the issue far upstream, if you do not take the time to address it, it will never end. So yes, you may not have time to take six months to fix your DevSecOps thing, but that means that for the rest of eternity, 25% or whatever percent of your time is gonna be taken up by issues stemming from your bad DevSecOps. So take the time and fix it. You may have to park other things, and this is how you prioritize. Fix the things that uh, produce the biggest benefit first. Uh, yes, you are gonna to have to let some things slide, um, but you know, this is where communication comes in. You have to explain this to your management. Like, do you want something that's going to cut costs and risk long term? Then you either need to get me some more resource or accept that we're going to have risk in this area for a longer period of time while we fundamentally and long term fix this issue here. Um, if you don't have, if they don't follow your guidance, um, I mean, when I set up a security program, it's about the very first thing. Job number one is getting traction from the absolute top. So if they don't listen to you, go above them, go above them, go above them. Make sure that the security message comes from on high. Um, but ideally, you don't necessarily. I, I like to measure success in. You want to establish the authority, but you kind of measure success in how little you of it you actually use. So you're able to influence positively in a good cultural way, uh, but 
some people are incredibly difficult and pig-headed and defensive, and that's when you got to make sure you, you've set up the authority on high. Because yeah, if, if I just go to, you know, if I, if I go to my neighbors and I bitch about something, they don't have to fix it. Uh, but if I then escalate to the landlord, the building manager, and the council and everything, eventually they're going to have no choice but to change their ways. Or we'll just sack them and get people who are more collaborative. That's, you know, that you want to avoid that scenario, but it's there, you know. If someone, after years and years and years, and you've tried everything and you've been positive and they've had all the warnings, they still don't want to play ball. Unfortunately, it's eventually going to lead to that, but that's their choice at that point. Fair comments. Um, Johnny Marie has asked, um, in my experience, it is usually the staff buy-in that's one of the biggest challenges of DevOps or DevSecOps. Um, what would be your recommendations for ensuring that staff across the board respect these practices and follow them properly? I think the big, uh, oh, you got some siren as well, Joe. Is that, is that the stash? Uh, this is Be More Pacific. Be More Pacific, there you go. <laughs> I think, um, Sorry, Steve. Can you repeat the question? I got distracted by Jay's beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, sorry. So it says, in my experience, it is usually the staff buy-in that is one of the biggest challenges of DevOps or DevSecOps. Um, what would be your recommendations for ensuring that staff across the board respect these practices and follow them properly? I think I think the big, the best thing you can do is explain to them why or or how. If you just tell someone, you know, it's like telling a child not to do something. They don't know why you've told them not to do it, so it's difficult for them to stick to it because they don't realize the importance of it. If you if you go out and you show them and you show them the process and it's like, look, this this is the kind of stuff we find and this is the kind of stuff that uh, that can happen and you know here's how that gets exploited. If they understand the reason behind it, then all of a sudden it's not just some extra thing that you're asking them to do that they don't understand why. It starts making sense. They start realizing why it's important, uh, and I think that's going to get you a lot more traction. What do you think, Jay? So I, I think I'm going to sound like a broken record here, and I do apologise if I do. Uh, but it all it all goes down to the whole culture kind of thing. You know, if you if you have a toxic environment, people are, are, are going to ignore things. They want to go home at the end of the day as quick as possible. If you have a more positive, you know, you know all encompassing environment, people are going to listen to you a lot better because they're going to respect you, uh, not just as as a as a person, but as a function. If you're this security function that plays the blame game, points the finger, punishes people, you're not going to be approachable. And that's going to rub off when it comes to security policies, security processes. They're just going to ignore it. And that's because you've created that environment. Yeah. Culture is everything, man. Absolutely. How does, um, Ah, this is from Anonymous, actually, but um, how does test tooling play a contributing factor, e.g. automated API testing, sort of security-wise? Um, to either of you. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Greg? I, I, I actually, uh, I mean, it, it almost seems self-evident. I mean, you know, you, you find the issues, it gives you it gives you metrics, it gives you something to feedback, it gives you something to educate with. Obviously, it's it's QA. You, you, know, you decide whether you're happy with this code with those issues or to send it back. Uh, you know, it's, it's your point of reference. Yeah. So there's a, a really, there's a quite a renowned security uh, researcher, Chris Powell, and he will tell you the importance of testing when it comes to applications, um, purely because he lives and breathes zero days in people's applications. So, you know, he, he's the guy to go to. But um, the, the testing is absolutely paramount when it comes to identifying not only vulnerabilities, but security defects, as well as something that could potentially break. So when I go back to the whole, the old fuzzing conversation, if you're pushing various amounts of different random input into an application and it breaks, uh, you may not have seen that if your testing wasn't in place. Um, but you also need to remember that your testing needs to have a good communication feedback loop to the relevant teams. There's no point just sending that report back to security, send it back to the developers, and just say, hey, look, guys, we've seen this. Can you help help us understand it? And that you know, you bridge that communication gap. You know, you the security team sit down with the developer teams and just help each other understand the application. Security people aren't developers, so you know, as pe as someone has said, we can't babysit developers, and uh, you know, developers can't babysit us. It, it works both ways. We need to have these you know good adult conversations. Sit down and say, look, this is what the testing phase has brought up. Can you help us understand it and see if we can alleviate it or have some compensating control to mitigate this risk? 
Cool. Um, yeah, we've got a lot of questions coming in and we will definitely sort of get through to them at the end. But essentially, it's time for, yeah, um, Shane and Greg to put us in the firing line and, you know, ask away, fellas, on, on basically now what we're going to discuss is the uh, recruitment processes in cybersecurity at this moment in time and kind of going through this, um, you know, with this ever fabled um, skills gap. Um, I can see Jay's licking his lips. So, um, yeah, um, absolutely. You know, let's have a go. What would you like to ask us? Oscar, so I'm going to start off here, and I think the, the big one here, and I think this is going to really set the tone, is what the hell is the skills gap? And where does it come from? <laughs> um, Steve, I'm happy to have a go at this first. Uh, before, before you, if you want to. Yeah, over to you, mate. <laughs> um, so in terms of the skills gap, essentially what I personally think it is, is it's basically top down sort of uh, there's been a miscommunication from the top down so essentially um, around seven in ten sort of you know businesses in the cyber security sector in the last three years have, have all tried to recruit a cyber security professional um, but essentially a third of these um, have come back and reported that these roles are hard to fill now now 33 percent is you know that's a lot of companies that you know are struggling to fill cyber security um, sort of positions and Essentially, it's, it's really quick and it's really easy to blame it on this skills gap. But I think that essentially is putting all the blame on the, the industry, on, on individuals in the industry, um, when they don't know what, what this sort of skills gap is. Um, now, essentially, it's reported that essentially 43% was because the applications lacked the technical skills. Now, Steve will, will uh, also sort of support me on this. We, we actually had sort of... Um, we had a role on a, a few months ago and it's for a SOC analyst position and it was like a, it was like five stages they sort of had to do um you know a competency-based interview they had to do just a, a normal like phone screening they had to do a presentation as well and there was like two other tests it was like uh so ridiculous and like they have to do a vo2 max test and a bleep test it was just like com completely not relevant for a i'm jay i'm joking i can see your face on that but essentially <laughs> they, they were actually but i'm saying that the, the point was, was the fact that it just wasn't needed for a SOC analyst position. Um, so essentially, that, that, that's my thoughts. And that's where the, the change needs to happen, is that we're not putting the right processes in play um, from the top downwards. Whoever's writing the spec, it's then having an impact on what us as recruiters then have to go back to sort of candidates in the industry and the, the, the sort of interview processes aren't the right one. So no wonder they're not meeting the criteria, because I just think it wasn't right from the get-go um steve uh what's your sort of opinion on that yeah i think yeah. you pretty much summed it up and, and that was a a really good example actually because obviously it was quite a recent one that you and i both experienced together um we did touch on it the other day with jay but yeah you know when you when you're asking a you're looking for a security analyst and then you're, you're expecting them to come in and do a 20 30 minute presentation it, it's a bit like well i mean have you really evaluated what what it is you're looking for here i mean there is no need for that at all um and like i said it, i think it's messages from the top to bottom i think it's more of a um people having an uh, an over a more of an understanding i think from the bottom up or from the top down um in this instance um of what security is is and how it is an enabler for your IT and really what these people are going to come into your organization and do. I think that's the most important thing and that, that will only come through communication internally, I think. Can I, can I ask like, it would be like a simpler question. So why there even is such a, a top to bottom? You know, I, I find it I find it weird because uh, you know, in the past when I've, I've needed staff, I'll just put a link, uh, a post on LinkedIn, I'll get a few candidates and I'm like, yeah, yeah, you'll do. Uh, and that was it. And I don't understand how, you know, I, I hear like recruiters talking to HR who talk to hiring managers. And I'm like, I don't even understand why there's this many levels. And a lot of hiring managers are like, are like oh, because you know, I'm so busy, I don't have time. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but it takes me 20 times more effort and time to jump through H HR's loop, like, various loops than it does to do this myself so i don't know if, if anything i skip hr because that saves me lots of time it's not the it's the, you know everybody else seems to look at it the other way around i need to go to hr because i don't have time to recruit myself i mean it takes me half a day to recruit someone myself whereas it takes me weeks of forms and frustrations to go through hr um and there seems to be quite a disconnect as well different topic 
I definitely I what you're saying, Greg. Um, and to be honest, I think what is sometimes um, sort of eluded is the sense that um, recruiters often uh, sort of forgotten that we, we are all also after this successful outcome. You know, we're, we're all after a successful outcome, whether that's, you know, a client sort of, you know, getting a candidate on board, you know, fast and taking their, 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 their sort of recruitment seriously, it, whether it's from a candidate's point of view where they come to recruiters and essentially like, help, like please can you help me get a job. Um, our successful outcome is the exact same. We want to, you know, meet you guys in the middle. And from that, you know, what we try and instill is very much a collaborative relationship with, you know, whether it is like a line manager or whether it is um, sort of HR, we, we, we try and, you know, standardise the procedure for everyone so that it, it, it is quick and easy and it, it doesn't affect you guys sort of who, who has to focus on your day jobs. Um, essentially, you know, the, the process that me and Steve try to follow is, you know, straight away when we get a, like a, a job spec written, um, we like to get you on the phone straight away because we want to bring that to life because uh, there's only so much it can tell us. Um, so essentially from that, we, we, we like to, you know, from the spec call, we want to, you know, deliver you sort of, you know, you know, five CVs in, in the space of, you know, 24, 48 hours with a call scheduled the next day um, for feedback with the first stage interviews and the second stage interviews the following week. It's very sort of, you know, procedure followed. Um, but what we tend to see in cyber recruitment at this moment in time, when there is a, a lack of communication between, uh, you know, the recruitment company and, you know, the hiring managers, is the same, it's, it's kind of like the housing market, actually. It's those who move the fastest tend to secure the best talent just because they're taking that seriously. Um, those who tend to move a little bit slower tend to, tend to lose some really sort of highly skilled professionals. Um, and it, it's because people have, you know, the, it, a job is what you get up for in the moment. So you can't just wait around it and go at that pace. Um, and that's what we try and instill with, with, with every client we work with. Um, I don't know if you agree, Steve. Kind of a... Uh stealing my thunder a little bit nick do you oh, sorry, sorry, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no no it's fine um no no totally and to go back to greg's point i think um the process would 100 percent be streamed. and obviously part of this conversation is about how processes can be improved from both sides um you know hr have a job to do they all have a job to do um i think that you know because of things that have gone on or whatever you know the, the i think unfortunately recruiters are seen a, as a, a a nuisance or whatever by by hr and and the, rea the reality of it is like you said we, we we want to work collaboratively with people like greg people like jay um you know and any sort of hiring manager we we want to get the process moved on as fast as possible um and the quickest way to do that is with a direct line um the more stop gaps you put in between the sort of what what needs to happen it just gets drawn out um, and you know then you have notice periods and all this sort of stuff as well so you know you have a need for your team and, and our job is to be again a little bit like technology and, and the difficulties that technology had with a business and what security is now having with technology is that we, sh we should be seen as an enabler but we're not um, and it's about again open dialogue and and really just talking and, and, and trying to work out those processes and what's the quickest way to basically enable your organization to get what you want um, and that would be by <laughs> taking some of these stop gaps out like you said um, but at the same time you know HR have a job to do I, I do totally understand that and I do totally sympathize with them but yeah the, the frustrations are, are certainly both sides. The thing is and I've, you know we mentioned this a few times in, in the previous discussion culture is so important like to me like the culture of an, of an individual is more important than any static skills they have at this moment in time because it, it dictates how they can adapt what you know how, how they can learn how they can influence to me that's the most important skill of all and the current process where you're going through a piece of paper from it you know and then maybe a recruiter then hr then the hiring manager you lose all side of that like i'll get you know, hey, which which one of these people should we hire? And I get half a dozen resumes. I'm like, I have absolutely no idea. Get me ten minutes on the phone with all of them. I don't even. I don't need to look at the resume. I need five minutes, ten minutes on the phone with them, and I'll tell you which one's the best. Um, and that we we've managed to create a process that I think filters out what the most important thing is. And I think this is why you've got so many people who have so much potential. You know. Uh, even if we did have this big shortage of people, which I don't believe we, we do, I think our approach is wrong to security in general, and that's why we need such a, a massive bodies. But if if we did have this massive shortage, there's so much talent out there that is not being picked up. You know, people that could be up to speed in months and doing you know tremendous work, 
because, well, because they don't have a work history, because they can't tick boxes on the resume, but they have everything that's there, but we don't have a process that recognizes that. And that, that really pisses me off, to be honest, because it throws human beings away. And it's, it's really interesting when you look at like, you know, we talked about like five rounds of interviews for like a junior or mid-level analyst, uh, and that's not unheard of, and tests and presentations, and you, you go for a C-level interview, it's like a half hour phone call or a one hour phone call, you spend half of it shooting the shit, your certifications aren't questioned, your experience isn't questioned, you know, you talk to talk, yeah, yeah, you could tell, you know what, you just kind of assume or you can tell this person knows what they're talking about, and the most important thing is like, we see eye to eye, we get along, I, you know, I like this person's character, I like their motivation, I like this and that. And it's, you know, it's two interviews, you know, and it's it's very casual um, and it's easy. So why are we taking, you know, people who relatively simple technical roles, you know, you know, where, yeah, okay, there's some technology, but you can pick that up on the fly. Why, why are we grilling them through five rounds of interviews? It's, it's ridiculous. Um, you know. And in, 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 what, in what situations would you like? Because I, I agree, I think two stages is, is enough. But in what stages do you think, or what roles do you think require a little bit more? What's your opinion on that? I can't really think of anything that requires more stages, to be honest. Yeah. Why, why do you need stages? So if one and gone, good, you, good enough for you, just, just a telephone call? Or is it is it like two stages for a technical one? I don't one? see any need for a hierarchy. I, I could see like, hey, we had the initial interview, and then afterwards, oh yeah, I forgot about this or I forgot about that. And maybe like a quick follow-up session or question if you've forgotten about something. There's no reason to have stages. I can't think I can't think of one practical reason why you need stages. Get the stakeholder. We like this person. Yes, hire them. Let's get going. Yeah. And obviously, you know, both you and uh, Jay have uh, have both been sort of, you know, looking for jobs yourself in sort of 2020, you know, uh, Jay, if you want to sort of tip it or, or Greg, you know, you know, you know, what's been the sort of difficulties that you've sort of found this year's guys? Well, I, I think the difficulties I found is when you're having to go through layers and they're applying that traditional process and you, either they don't understand anything and they, they're quite um, dismissive because that you know, well, you don't have this particular tick box that we've been told to look for without even knowing what what it means, um, and usually it's because well, it, it's such a basic thing you've not mentioned it on your resume, um, or they're looking for or you know, oh we know that someone in the process is going to be looking for this and on paper you don't have that so they pre-filter you and all this stuff, um, and then you've got other and and the successful conversations are. You know, I, I had one and it was, I didn't even realize it was an interview. It was just someone that basically called me up and they said, um, yeah, I've, I've, you know, I've come here, I've taken over this function. I'm, I'm concerned there's some gaps. I thought, you know, people call me up to pick my brain for half an hour all the time. So I thought it was just one of those. And then the next thing he said was, um, um, I used to work with so-and-so and he spoke very highly of you. I'm like, oh, that's nice. I like, I've never heard him speak highly of anyone. When can you start? What's your rate? And, you know, that was it, <laughs> you know, and that, that was literally it, you know, and, and with the THG as well. I mean, that fell to pieces, but that was group CTO for an hour, chit chat, uh, half 35 minutes with the co-founder of the company. Ten minutes of that was about dogs and, and that was it, you know, yeah. Dabo. So that why are we doing that at senior level where we we value the cultural fit? And we're making people run through all these loop, loops of, of what's not important at more junior levels. It's weird that we recognize that this is what makes good leaders, but it's the same thing that makes good employees. You know, so why don't we apply the same standards? Why are we making it so much more difficult for people who are lower down the chain? It's completely unnecessary. Yeah, and that's 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 a really good point. And it's probably a really good. Jay, like, what, what's your point of view? Obviously, you know, um, sort of on, on on a little bit of a different sort of spectrum. Do you do you do you agree with that? Can I yeah. just add one thing first? Yeah, sure. I, th I think it's part of like really crappy middle management culture. It's like when when HR like implements these rules that you have to have a monthly one to one. And it's like, why the hell do I have a month? And you have to report on it and get it signed off by my employees that I had the one to one. I'm like, why, why are we doing this? Why is this being imposed? Why is there all this overhead? Oh, because we want to make sure that managers have time with their people. 
Like half an hour a month. What, you don't think I'm not sitting on the corner of their desk for an hour a day chit-chatting? You know, we're sitting next to each other. We're constantly all day long. We've got a, a, a WhatsApp group chat for in the evenings when we're still talking. You know, all, all my, my former team, they're on the WhatsApp chat. Like we're talking all the time. But in the past, all my managers is like, yeah, I would see them for half an hour once a month. And that's that's ridiculous. And I think that's the reason why we're, we're not treating people like human beings. And that's why we're putting them through these tick boxes as opposed to, yeah, the potential is there and I'm going to nurture that potential. Well, the problem is that the managers aren't there to nurture the potential. But that's not the employee's fault. That's not the employee's problem. That's the manager not doing his job. Sorry, Jay, go ahead. Yeah, so I agree with it all. Um, the only thing that I have a little bit of a disagreement with is the, the one way that we can get around the, the, the kind of unicorn mentality that a lot of these businesses have that they want all these different skills is why don't we just give people a chance and have a method of testing these skills? So stage one, you know, you've applied for this job, okay, here's a challenge. You know, do this challenge that aligns with the skills that you're going to be using in the role. So if you're a security analyst or a SOC analyst, give them like a log file, an example log file, and get them to build a report based on what they found in that log file. And that just shows you their ability, um, even without any experience. Uh, and then you can basically give them a score. So you give them a score about what they're finding. Um, and you can say the top five top scorers get a next stage interview. And you pick one out of those five or pick two out of those five. Because what, what we seem to have is we're not putting people forward because they haven't got experience, yet we're wanting people. And if you want people, you need to be a person yourself. You need to understand that these people can actually bring something to your business. Just because they haven't got experience doesn't mean they're not going to be any good. I mean, you can bring someone as junior and you can train them up to be the best analyst. And then in about two, three years time, you're going to have, you know, you know, a super hot analyst going in your business because you've nurtured that. I, I totally I think that's a great approach that's because it's it's you know, focus on the outcome like who gives a crap about the tick box list of experience or whatever focus on the, the outcome you know um well, like when we started it's Salford like the, the first guy I hired 21 years old recruiter gave him to me didn't want a fee because it's like this guy's unemployable he turned out fantastic you know within three months he was schooling our, our 10 plus year IT ops guys onto how to use 365 and Sentinel and all this stuff uh, and you know, sure enough, uh, BT poached him for double his salary, and that was three months ago. And now they've asked him to apply for a shift lead position. You know, the guy's got like 12, 13 months of experience. But and it's it's funny how all the people that didn't want to touch him because oh, he's got no experience. After he spent what nine months actually in in the sector and and no training, just his own initiative, learning stuff. All of a sudden, he's worth a pretty penny, and people want to poach him, and within months, want to promote him. It's like this is the same person that a year ago you wouldn't touch. Give people a chance. Yeah, that's it. Just give people a chance, you know. And I, I like it's it's about their potential, and it's about the output that they could deliver. So I think that that's you know, give them instead of asking them all these questions and do you have blah 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 blah, give them the actual challenge that they would be facing. Because if, if, if I don't know something, you know, I used Slack for the first time two weeks ago. I, mean, I pick, picked it up in a day, you know, uh, five minutes. Uh, you know, I've not used Atlassian before. I've not used all these things before. It's like, it, who cares? It takes a couple of days. You pick it up, you figure out how it works. Uh, and it's the same way. But you, you have to appreciate that potential. And if you set them a challenge and allow them to Google something and fix it and still deliver the outcome, then who cares? You got the outcomes. I think that's a fantastic way of measuring. Yeah, that, that would be one good way of, of having stages where you issue the challenge, you get the outcome, you move on to the next stage. That would make sense to me. The way, the way we're doing it now, stages, there's no point. No, oh, well, and that's a terrific point, guys. And uh, just 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 put a pin in that at the moment. Um, I appreciate it's seven o'clock, guys. Um, and if, if those who want to shoot off, you can do. But we will sort of be carrying on. Um, you know, there's still more questions to be sort of answered in the Q and A. Um, but yeah, on, on that point, um, I've actually got a question for, for you guys as well. Um, in the sense of like, what what would you guys like to see sort of changed? Um, maybe from us guys as recruiters in in 2021, or if um, you know the change needs to happen, you know, internally from companies what needs to change in 2021 to make it easier for cyber professionals um you know to get jobs that's I've a great not, question i mean i don't know if it's a 2021 thing because it's for some reason we think change comes with years 
<laughs> well, let's just put 2020 behind us. Nothing else is happening, Greg. Yeah. Right? <laughs> any, any excuse for that, that's good. Yeah. No, but I think like um, so a HR is not specialized in, in security, right? So there are, there are unique requirements for security. Now let's not delude ourselves and think that we're special. We're just different than marketing people and this and that. So they they won't have a specific understanding of, of the roles and they may not specifically understand what the hiring manager wants if the hiring manager is going through HR, not speaking directly to candidates. Um, so I think I think the role of a recruiter there could maybe be to provide that additional understanding that um, you know that insight that HR doesn't have. And I would like to get to a point where I mean, okay, I've, I'm fortunate in that I've got uh, a fairly large network and I can quite easily find people myself. But if I didn't, like most hiring managers, I'd, I'd want a recruiter that I had a trusted relationship with who understood me, understood my organization, my management style, you know, how I speak my language, what I mean when I say things, and then finds me the right person. And that when the recruiter is in there and, uh, brings me someone like the relationship is so strong and they understand me so well that I have a high degree of trust in that recruiter to take that candidate. Uh, I think that that should be the excellence that recruiters strive for. And I think some some do, uh, but there's also you know a ton of saturation where uh, you know today I was offered uh, a information security officer job for 22K a year by someone who worked at Topshop three months ago. So that's that's the other side of the security. So when do you start? Guys? I think, um, yeah. <laughs> when do you start, start mate? I, I, had, um, I had a few uh, technical issues there, but no, 100% Greg, and, and, it, it, and it definitely ties back to what I was saying about having those, you, being able to have that direct, you know, being able to talk to you directly uh, or any hiring manager. Like you said, you know, I, I've got people I've worked with for the last two and a half years out now that I know either the minute something comes up within their team or whether or the minute somebody comes onto the market that I know would fit their team, I know I can send them to them. I know what they want. I know the culture fit. I've been to the office. I've seen it. I've spoke to them. Um, I know what they're looking for. And I don't just mean in skills. You know, it, it, it is about the person as well. You know, at the end of the day, you're going to spend eight, nine, ten hours a day with this person. Um, the skills are not secondary but they're just you know the, the personality fit is just as important and like you said that the, the i think the real thing that is missing and, and you and you touched on it perfectly there is that is trust there has to be a trust uh you need to trust in the recruiters to be able to know what and the only way we'll be able to do that is by having an open dialogue and by talking and communicating and and learning what it is you're doing what your plans are moving forward what you're looking for in your team Unfortunately, I think too many recruiters are going by volume. I think the average turnover for recruiters is about 12 months. That's average. So as some people are there for 10 years. Um, a lot of recruitment, uh, again, volume, so not necessarily the, the highest standards. Um, yeah, it, it kind of spoils it for, for everyone a bit. But I, th I think you said something great there. It's not just knowing the hiring manager, but actually have been to the office. So if, if you've seen the team, you get an idea of how what the team is like, so you know if someone's going to fit well. Uh, I, I think that's that's pretty spot on, and something that Nick actually was trying to do with me was actually not find a role for me, well, also, but actually talk to people and generate a role that I could then fill. Which I think that's kind of the holy grail of you know you don't even have a role listed, but listen, I know someone who would be excellent for your organization and would contribute value. Would you be able to create a position? And uh, you know, I think that that's the holy grail. If you've got that level of, of trust with a client where you know, they trust you that I've got someone that will deliver value for you, make a space for them and they do it. What's better than that? Absolutely. Yes. And, and, and Jay, um, you know, any any sort of point of view, it's obviously, you know, um, fr from your side of fence, because, you know, you've, you've you know, uh, moved into a new role and it, it seemed pretty pretty streamlined to be fair it seemed pretty pretty okay is that what you sort of would would recommend you know future processes to be like or you know was it not as streamlined as i thought so it was extremely uh streamlined it was literally um conversation on linkedin one day phone call the next day um 
a job offer pretty much five days later. And I think the, the thing that I always tell people is that you need to have a network. You need to get around these barriers. Uh, you know, yes, you know, you're going to have to go through recruitment. You're going to have to go through HR. But if you get directly to the hiring manager and you have that relationship with them, then it's going to be a lot less painful, especially if you start to go to, you know, have relationship with the, the more senior managers, then you're going to have a really nice time when it comes to trying to find a role with them because you've already got that repertoire with them. You've already got that reputation with them. And when, when that happens, it's a lot easier because they don't have to get to know you. They know you. They just want to have the formalities of an interview and then you see what comes of it. Yeah, I, I would advise like the, the best thing you can do and people are always like, oh, well, what training should I take? What what certification should I take? What kind of you know course should I do? Network, network. The networking part is, you know, obviously you need to know your stuff, but the networking is always going to be more important. It's always going to be more important because, yeah, I mean, you've, you've nailed it there, Jamin. If if I know if if I know you're available and all of a sudden I have a need and a, a role and a budget and it's approved. Why wouldn't I go to you? Why why would I go to a recruiter? And, sorry guys. Well, why would I go to a recruiter and and you know pay money and and have someone look for someone I already know someone? So put put yourself in that position. Uh, and it's you know it's, look at LinkedIn. You know you, you you're on the market. You post something. You know I I took a job. It fell through. I posted something, and. I think that post got like 60,000 view, 500 reactions, 300 something comments, and you know, several interviews came out of it. A couple, quite a few close calls, um, but you know, people share, people see you, and you know, next thing you know, like 5,000 people, of which you know, 30 hiring managers, of which five happen to be hiring at that moment, will see you, and you know, they see. Oh, I don't know who this person is, or they, maybe they do, but even if they don't, you got 200 people commenting on them, recommending them. And clearly there's something they're worth checking out as opposed to sifting you know for, through a pile of resumes that you've been handing that you have no idea who these people are so it's yeah networking is is everything um it's it's life-changing you know like i came to the uk two and a half years ago and i had I think, you know five six connections and, and maybe you know less than 50 in the uk uh took me nine months to find a job now i've got fifteen thousand, and yeah it definitely helps People, you know, CEOs call you up and say, hey, I hear you're looking. I want to meet with my ex-co. Absolutely. Networking is it's absolutely important in this day of age. You know, uh, we, we are in technology and we've got the platform like LinkedIn, but there's so many other ways uh, like meetups like this. But um, I kind of just wanted to pose a question that, that Matt Ellis has also put in. Um, the chat to you guys um, and he essentially said that um, you know 43% of people are sort of lacking uh, well jobs that he's seen are lacking technical uh, skills so he sees positions advertised all the time expecting in-depth knowledge across all sorts of platforms um, such as RPS, WAF, DLP, NAC, cryptography etc. He basically said that you wouldn't expect a bricklayer to come in and do the plumbing in your house so why do we have unicorn role profiles in security? I oh Jay, I think you're on mute, mate. If you're trying to speak, can I Sorry. Just with with like I struggle with our definition of the unicorn because everyone says unicorn is the guy who's got all or guy or girl whatever who's got all these skills, all these certifications. For me, the unicorn is the one who's got the right attitude and aptitude and can learn anything. I don't care what they have now. It's it's the person that has the potential. That's my unicorn. And in, in if anything, the ones that have all these technical skills tend to be a bit narrow-minded and. and less flexible I, I consider them less unicorny than the ones who you know i'm not trying to sound corny <laughs> but I, I would rather have the one that's totally flexible sorry jay go on that's, i just want to preface so, so it actually reminds me of a story that um i was told by my boss um he was like do you have any idea how to use this WAF tool and i was just like yes i do i've used it quite a lot complete lie so what i did was that day i you know studied it religiously and i came back in the morning and i was using the tool and that's how easy a lot of these tools are to use they're very intuitive mostly all the sims are the same they ingest data the output alerts you just investigate the alerts so they're very much the same waf is very much the same kind of thing dlp and they see a lot of these tools are pretty much one-on-one -on -one the same so if you use one you've used them all 
Um, and the, the concepts apply. So if you've done your Network Plus and you know what Web Application Firewall is and the Security Plus, and you know what Web Application Firewall is, the concepts apply to the tool. And if you can apply the concepts to the tool, you already have the understanding of how the tool works. It's just knowing how their user interface works. And that's just the half the battle. And it, it blows my mind okay. how much we, we filter on that. Oh, sorry, we want someone with Palo Alto experience. You've only used Fortinet and Cisco as a, if you know TCP IP inside and out, and you know the ISO, you know the OSI model, and you know your operating systems, and you know routing and switching, it gives you. I mean, it's the interface that changes. Exactly. You know, I've this I've is... never driven a Mercedes. I'm pretty sure I could manage it, even if the light button is over here, and this thing that I'm used to being a knob is on the stock, and you know, I'll figure it out. You know, it's just the interface that's different, and yet we're so difficult about it. It's. A, it blows my mind. It's like we assume that humans are robots incapable of learning something new. It's like, how do you think they got to this stage? And clearly they figured that out. But we really, we really do it that way. And it's it's bizarre, you know? It's like, look at like the financial services one, they're my favorite. They only want people in financial services. Yes, because anyone not in financial services is unable to read some regulations and apply them. It was like, yes, we have regs in our industries as well, and we've got new ones all the time, and we read them and we update, and you know, there's nothing special about your banking regs. We can read those two and apply them the next day. And you're ruling out all the all the kind of insights. You're ruling out all the people that may have insights from other industries that could benefit you. So you're, you're basically inbreathing is what you're doing there. Steve, are you going to jump, jump in then, mate? Oh yeah, no. I was just backing up really what something that um, well, both Jay and Greg were talking about there. Yeah, it's a conversation I have with some of my clients all the time, um, particularly around seam tools. Um, you know, you might have one organisation that might be running Splunk, or they might another one that might be running ArcSight. Um, and I've got a couple of my clients that are looking at things like Azure Sentinel. But from talking to professionals like Greg and Jay, you know, a lot of it is that is transferable skills so when someone says to me must have experience with Splunk it's it's a conversation that needs to be had so well as long as it's an enterprise level seam tool you know the rest of it can be sort of transferred um and it, again it's about that dialogue and, and and being open about that because like like Greg says very rightly there that there are a lot of transferable skills just because there's something written down um with a name on it it doesn't mean that other people can't use the same tools with a little bit, you know, a couple of weeks of just, you know, just looking up at just the, the, the slight differences, you know, with, with between them. It actually makes a job more interested, more interesting, and it makes the candidate more motivated if it is a different tool than what he or she's used before. Because, sure. hey, I have to do something new is different. Be, you know, I'll get to learn something. It'll be fun. As opposed to the same guy who's been using the same solar winds for the last, you know, 30 years, whatever. Uh, I'd... I look forward to, you know, if I if I get like a job interview in a position and it's like I've not done that before. That's actually the thing that makes this job interesting to me because I'll get to learn something and that's that's what's going to motivate me and, and have me make deliver better outcomes and better outputs because you've, you've got something new and fresh that excites me. I don't I don't want to do the same thing over and over and over. Could you imagine being like specializing in one tool and only using one tool your entire career? Ugh. There you go. I've run out of scotch. <laughs> there you go. Level Peggy. Sorry, I was just on my mute then. Um, so yeah, obviously last chance to obviously you know get some questions in, guys. Um, uh, we have got a, a peculiar one here actually for, for you, Jay. Um, obviously, you know, I think. Do you have any difficulty in acquiring a new role, not just a seasonal one, whilst dressing up as a reindeer? I mean, uh, did you attend any of your interviews with them yeah. bells in your beard? No, so actually, I, I, I did attend a lot of my interviews, seriously. Um, <laughs> I think the process would have been a lot smoother if I did attend as a reindeer. So that's, you know, don't take my advice on that. So please don't attend interviews if you've got any lined up as reindeers. Um, you know, don't do it me. <laughs> I just took a screenshot, so I just realised I could show them. Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> GDPR. <laughs> I'll, I'll anonymize your name, as as if anyone in this industry doesn't know who you are. <laughs> I think that's. I think it's fantastic because you've. I mean, you've come onto the scene and like the level of traction you get with posts because it's it's like you know it's kind of like the pyramid of roles. You know, there's 
there's only, I think someone said the other day, there's only about 900 CISOs in the UK where you know, there's tens of thousands, 100,000 analysts and stuff. So people, you're you're more relatable to more people and you're also kind of, you know, cl closer yeah. towards the beginning of your career, whereas I'm kind of stalled out. Uh, and everyone, like, you, you've got in, you've made it, you know, you've got the personality, everyone wants to be, everybody wants to be like Jay. Uh, <laughs> so I noticed you get like tremendous, you did a post the other day about this talk mentioning me and I was quite lazy. So I just took your post and I switched the names. You know, join me with Jay, and you were like, join me with Greg. I just did that, and I just, I just reposted the exact same post, and I don't know how many comments and likes you got on yours, but I think it was like ten times what I got on mine. And even though I, like, yeah, and it's because I technically have more followers, but you have more impact with your follower, with way more impact with the base that you have. It's growing very quickly as well. I think Jay's. Yeah. A, a huge example for the for the industry right now. Rob. So I think you know a lot of it comes through you know engaging with the right people, building that community, and then that and so it helps you with your job hunt as well. I mean, a lot of people forget that I'm only just a stock analyst. You know, I've, I've I've literally done three years in security, but it's how you manage your time and how much effort you put into you know building your network, building your professional repertoire, and you know getting your name out there. And that's in turn going to help you with your job search as well. I think you've done that really well because I'm like I've been in this like 22, 23 years, and I I only really figured out the networking stuff, yeah, like two two and a half years ago. Well, I think you touched on something there, Jay, though, which is really important, which, which again comes back to what we were talking about earlier. In that, yeah, you know, you say you've done security for three years, but it's evident to anybody that talks to you uh, that you you're you know light years ahead of where if you looked at the average job spec you're light years ahead knowledge wise in terms of where that would expect someone to be when they say well we want five years experience of this and six years experience of that you know it again it it touches on it's the attitude of of learning your craft and, and being part of the community and, and things like that and i think you know yourself that you know you are a testament to that really thank you yeah it, it, it is ridiculous, isn't it? Because it's, you know, it's like what we were saying like in financial services, they, they genuinely don't think you're able to learn, you know, read a, a document of regulations and learn it and apply it. Like, why? We're not idiots. You know, I remember, I don't read nearly as much as I used to, but I remember, you know, when I was starting out in security, more as a teenage hacker than anything else, but I, I just read a book every week. Naughty, naughty. But, you know, <laughs> one week, you know, you, Read a book on Linux, and the next book you read a book a week you read a book on TCP/IP, and then you read one on you know send mail, and then on DNS, and then on routing, and you know, after 52 weeks, that's 52 books you read. You know, you know, you know eight operating systems, you know three programming languages, you know networking inside and out, you know, you know, and that's in the space of less than a year. So what's what's this like? You need six years of experience. You know, I, I interviewed a kid who was like 18 years old. Now I left the role, so I didn't get the opportunity to hire him. I highly recommended him. Uh, you know, of all the candidates, he was 18 years old, and he was like, "Holy crap, this this guy really knows his stuff." And you know, he'd learned everything in in the last couple of years. But he was so hungry for knowledge. And is that sort of what, you, what you look for, Greg? Is it, is it like that hunger that you have to try and see from every single one, regardless of if you know he's absolutely qualification out, out, out of his ears? You know what I mean? Like it, it, they've got to have that hunger that you need to be on your team. I, I just don't care. I mean, I, I don't. I don't really care about. Well, because you know, someone. Ha everyone is like everybody wants someone who's got five or six years of experience, but the pipeline has to start somewhere. Someone has to take the the people that are just starting out. And the funny, it's it's amazing how nobody wants these people, and you know I'm, I'm laughing my ass off because I'm hiring people for like twenty grand a year who are incredibly grateful to get this opportunity, super motivated, super loyal. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to pay them more, but you know I work for a university, so that's just the money we had. Um, and that they're, they're fantastic, and it's it's really rewarding. They're grateful, and it's you know you, you I remember like the first guy I hired. Ryan, who again, you know, he he got coached for double his salary, and now he's being promoted. And I had a recruiter call me today for another recommendation because they wanted to put him forward somewhere else. So, I mean, he's literally in like 13 months' time increased his income by about 150 percent, and just because he picks stuff up, you know. And I I remember hiring him on attitude and aptitude, and we used 365, 
And I was like, well, I'll just get him a few books on 365 and I'll get him started that way. And I'd, I'd already hired him when I realized that Microsoft doesn't really make books on 365. You've got to take their courses, which we can't do. We don't have budget for. So I'm like, oh, crap. So I just got his first day. I was like, found like a few articles or here, start with these. And he just turned around like, oh, I've got like 17 webinars lined up. I'm good, you know. And he just drove it like a sponge. And within two months, you know, he was schooling everybody else that had been there for 10 years on, on, you know, what you could do with it and this and that. So, yeah, I mean, I think the um, human potential was like, you know. I think that was one of the um, first things, actually, that, I mean, when, when I first became aware of you, Greg, and, and sort of started talking to you, you know, you're a big advocate of um, not relying on frameworks and things. And then and then you sort of went to the University of Salford and, and you made a big deal out of, you know, taking graduates, you know, and, 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 and looking at the person and, and really growing them, giving people that first step on the ladder. Um, and funny enough, that's when I spoke to Nick about you as well, because we were in we were in Manchester. It, it was January time. And I said, you know, you, you should. And Nick was starting to work with security. I said, look, have a chat with Greg or, you know, connect with Greg. You know what he's doing there is really interesting. And, you know, he's giving people a chance. The one thing that a lot of people have asked for but don't seem to be getting was the one thing that you were doing. Um, and I think that was I think that's what makes you stand out, I, I guess, in a sea of other people of your level. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, potential and also just flexibility and, well, Jay, you know, you know, Rick Johnson. Oh, yes, I know Rick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I met, I met, Rick Johnson was my, my second hire at the university and I was just kind of like, because I was really busy with, I need to get involved with all aspects of the business and researchers and academics and something and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm struggling for time. I need someone I can kind of trust who can, who's a really good communicator. So I went to, funny enough, a DevSecOps meetup, and after after the meetup, there was an overflow uh, of everyone went to the bar. So I'm in the bar with all these geeks, and here's this guy who, <laughs> I think he's 42 years old. He looks younger for than his age, but he's 42 years old, clearly older than everybody else in any case. And he's just he's just talking to all these geeks, and he's just getting along really well with them. And and he's talking to the barman, and he's talking to the suits at the next table, and obviously he's talking to the girls as well. And I'm like. But he's, he's speaking like completely comfortably, natively, really engaging with everyone. And I'm like, yeah, this guy can talk to anyone. I'll hire him. I was like, you need a job. And that's it, you know. And I, at, at first I was worried he was going to be a bit of a boozer, but that turned out all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, we actually ended up being really meticulous. Where I was like, well, you, need, you need to chill out a bit and not be so meticulous. Good is better than perfect. You know, done is better than perfect. But um, yeah, and you know, just... Can, can they can they achieve the outcome like you said Jay? That, that's all that matters yeah and the, the funny thing is people are like no we need someone trained we don't have we don't have the time or budget to train or you know like i can't spend all my my time babysitting them it's not like if you just create the right environment the, the stuff happens automatically you know I, th I think people some people have the impression that i'm sitting there you know spending 80 percent of my time next to their desk you know training them educating them it's not. They're just, you know, I, I appreciate that there are things you don't know, but, you know, that and, and that you need some time to learn, but you they do that on their own. You know? um, and you know, I, I try to provide insight and some guidance and some vision where, wherever I can. Uh, but other than that, they're totally self-sufficient. You know, you just yeah, I don't expect you to be able to do this right now, but you know, here's here's a hint, or you know, do it up to here and come back to me, and I'll give you some pointers for the next part. And that, that's all it is. It's it's really minimal, minimal effort, and these people develop themselves, and people need to realize that it's not this incredibly heavy, cumbersome thing. It's just if you have a little bit of faith, a little bit of trust, if you're available, you don't necessarily need to give tons of time. You just got to be available and positive and helpful. That's it. And you watch these people to, to grow all by themselves. And it's it's not nearly as much effort as, as people think. So you gotta you gotta you know have have more faith, have more trust in people. That's all I can say. No, that's a fair point. I think. Uh, what do you think, Nick? Should we uh, go on to some of the more technical questions, and then um, I know everyone's got an evening to go back to. So. Uh... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mike put in a, a really good question. Um, so Mike said um, a few mentions of your security team slash your SOC, etc. When is a good time 
i.e. the latest, in terms of growing engineering teams slash company size to create a security team. Um, essentially, DevSecOps is a great concept, but is it but is it scalable to an enterprise level or is security teams required, um, such as being alongside engineering teams working in DevSecOps manner? Short answer, yes, it's scalable, but it's as scalable as you want to make it. So if you have the proper orchestration and the proper automation, I know they're buzzwords, but orchestration is essentially how you manage your infrastructure in a more dynamic way. And automation is how you manage your infrastructure in a more you know, automated and self-sufficient way. Um, if you have those in place already, then you're probably going to have less strain on your resources anyway. So when it comes to actually building your security team, you don't have to worry too much about getting the resources through the door because you already have these resource saving uh, implementations. Uh, I think it's best to get the security teams in early because we need to understand the requirements a lot sooner. Once we understand the requirements, we can understand where the security um, may, be, may, may be needed along the line. And you need to understand, you know, I, I, a good friend of mine likes to talk about threat modeling quite a lot. And I think if you threat model your product and threat model your business very easily, you can kind of mitigate at least 99% of you know, known and researched threats to your business and to your application very quickly. Um, so then your resources won't be taken off in the back end because um, a security event has happened because you've already identified this quite early on. So this is, you know, we need to have this kind of proactive approach to security. Uh, and then your resources are gonna become freed up naturally because you've already dealt with it. Yeah, pretty much exactly what he said. I mean, you, you can never, you can never start too early with security. Uh, obviously, you know, if you've got three people in a company, you're probably not going to have a dedicated security person. But at some point it makes sense. But then the goal is not to have, you know, a massive security team and SOC picking up all these issues. It's to act as force multipliers, get involved upstream, do that threat modeling, do that, you know, what could go wrong, what needs to be changed, what needs to be, you know, proceduralized, where can we use education to, to improve the outcomes? Um, do that as kind of strategically as possible. Um, have input to to the others. I think you, you, the main reason you need a security person is to apply security mindset. The more you help people have that security mindset in their work, the fewer security people you need kind of retroactively or retrospectively. You know, you, you're going to have less detection and response if you spend the time fixing things upstream in your business so your pipelines are good. I think um, another one that, that, that's been touched on here by Azure Hair, um, thank you for that. Um, a lot of people are talking about artificial, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning. Um, uh, you know, a lot of organizations are looking at it, how it's going to escape the landscape moving forward. But it's a really good question, actually. What is the future landscape for cybersecurity and artificial intelligence? Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> no, <laughs> okay. I'm actually going to take this one um, and I'm normally a hater of artificial intelligence because it is a buzzword. Um, so we have this concept of um, artificial intelligence as, as general AI, which is general artificial intelligence that can apply learning from one concept and apply it to another concept. So learning how to cross a road and learning how to cross a highway, it can apply those different learnings into different concepts. But when it comes to uh, actual AI from the vendor AI, it's just machine learning under the hood. But we need to understand what's the requirement? Why do we need this? What's what, Why does the business need this, uh, this machine learning function? Because there might be something, as Greg says, a lot of the time further downstream, you know, we're just throwing a solution on top to try and fix this issue. You know, what's the output that we're trying to monitor with this machine learning? Uh, oh, is it a bad process? So you're developing these poorly, you know, designed machines or is your golden image that you're deploying all these machines are basically creating a vulnerable estate and you're using this machine learning algorithm to highlight these machines. Well, let's go fix that. Uh, and then you can probably just deploy a simple SIM tool on top of it, you know, and just monitor alerts and monitor logs. Uh, there's a lot of buzzwords, but you need to understand the requirements. What do you need these for? Exactly. It's it's like so much of like the AI and the automation right now is to bolster an approach that doesn't work in the first place. And we're just trying to, oh, we, we've we've used up all the people. Now let's use some AI on, on this problem. But you're just you're just dealing with stuff that is a result of something else. And it's just a distraction from 
just roll up your sleeves, take the initiative and fix that thing upstream. So you don't have, you know, you don't need 50 million pounds on a sock. If you improve your processes, your quality, your visibility, you know, you're not going to have that many incidents to, to respond exactly. to. Exactly. All of a sudden you need a million pound sock and you don't need the AI and you don't need the automation. Yeah, Every exactly. time you have an incident, find the root cause, fix that. You'll never have that kind of incident again. Exactly. Why medicate the symptoms when you can go and get a, a doctor exactly. to address the problems? Yeah. We've, we've basically, we've, we're using AI not as, in the most unintelligent way possible. It's like we've we've run out of humans. Throw some more AI at it. We're we're applying a you know artificial intelligence in an unintelligent way, and it's like, well, why develop intelligence to apply in an in intelli unintelligent concept and yeah. in a different context? It's like let's use it for to benefit our business in the future, not to try and solve our problems. But where, where do our problems come from? It's, I mean, you know, maybe if you want to apply it to doing something. You know, root cause analysis that then leads to some process re-engineering yeah. that there was better outcome but frankly we've got enough people to do that we've got plenty of people to do that because you, you look at the um like isc squared i remember seeing a presentation there and it has like the the four point four million seventy thousand people cyber skills gap and they had like the 20 uh most in demand roles how big the gap was and how big the gap was getting and every single one of those was a reactive role there was no, you know, business engagement. There was no process. There was no process engineering. There was no optimization. Everyone was in the sock, detecting the stuff, responding to stuff, or doing forensics. No one was actually making sure things were built properly and maintained properly. If you start doing that, you're not going to need four million people anymore. Chances okay. are half of them will be unemployed. And that's DevSecOps in a nutshell. There you do, go. Do it properly, and you won't have to do too much in the back end. Fortunately, enough people are doing that that we can all be employed at this point. But that's not the, but it's the correct way. <laughs> Got kids to feed. <laughs> uh, I think uh, that's more or less uh, brought us to a, a nice conclusion. To be fair, gents, um, it, it was great to have seen the more you know, passionate Jay got, the louder he got with the beard. Um, so before he uh, sort of deafens us with the more uh, sort of angry he gets. Um, I just like to sort of, yeah draw draw this to a close and you know um, you know first I just say a massive thanks to you know Greg and Jay for for hosting tonight um, and also you know uh, Steve for helping me sort of produce and yeah thanks everyone for sort of being in attendance as well. Um, this was our last one of sort of 2020 and we'll we'll be kicking back off in 2021 and um, so keep your eyes sort of peeled for the next event. Um, but if anybody's sort of interested in speaking at these future events, please drop me a line. But um, yeah, thanks a lot for coming along, guys. Yeah, appreciate no, thank it. Thanks. You I, I apologise for my uh, had some technical issues, so my camera is no longer working. But you can just hear my my voice booming in from the corner somewhere. <laughs> um, but again, thank you so much, Greg and Jay, for um, spending your evening um, sharing your wealth of knowledge, and appreciate everybody that's joined us. And hopefully, um, catch up with everybody soon. It was it was worth it just to see Jay's hair do to me. <laughs> it was. It absolutely was. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having us and thank you, everyone, for your support and uh, attending. Thanks, guys. Steve, Nick, Jay. Thanks a lot, guys. See you later. Bye. Thanks for listening to our ramblings. See you later, guys. Cheers. Ooh.